Bing bong pong. Hello, it's us again. Welcome to another episode of While I'm Building a CPU. Yes. Or Uni CPU, as we slangingly call it. So, yeah, so to start with, we um, started building the ALU, which we were pretty sure we were going to need, but since then we were had to do much more architectural planning so we can actually stop building things around it and you know, how the ALU was actually going to interact with the rest of the computer. Uh, yes, so we spent quite a bit of time in the library last night sort of looking at our block diagram, so something we've been doing in our Introduction to Computer Architectures module, um, looking at how the modules interact, where the inputs are and where the outputs are. And what data is going to be moving between what and what sort of control lines are going to be needed to keep all the data synchronised and stop it being corrupted. Okay, so we've made some progress with the hardware since the last episode. Uh, we've, well, Andre has finished his 8-bit adder. Uh, Charlie and I have managed to get these, the gator board going for subtraction. And since you've last seen it, there have also been some significant optimizations to what we already had, as well as the uh, new bits we've added. We're probably going to show you everything in the next in the next episode, so stay tuned. Right now, we're going to show. Right now, we're going to probably going to show you what what we did last night, mostly. Uh, it's going to be a stop motion animation about uh, of the process we used to build uh, to build a CPU diagram. Uh, we hope you enjoy, you're going to enjoy it. After this, we're going to explain everything and uh, detail how everything interacts with everything. This is our finished diagram. Um, you may remember from our first episode showing you the registers. Here we have our operand register and register X. Okay, so we've used a accumulator based architecture. Uh, what this means is that we can have a simpler set of instructions because the result from any calculation or arithmetic operation will always end up in one position. So when we send, uh, when we do a operation on two operands, it goes to the ALU it will always end up coming out of register Y and, coming and buffered, being buffered back to register X, which means that you don't have to specify the destination within each instruction. If you were to be doing uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3, uh, you'd start off with register X, which is your accumulator. It starts off at 0, so that's this. You'd put in your 1 uh, in the operand, and you'd set up the ALU with the uh, opcode for addition. Um, so that would put plus 1 into, the regist into register Y, which then gets sent around the memory buffer um, back up to register X. So that's because that's the accumulator, that's then got one in it. Two would then go into the operand, and one and two would get added in the ALU, and three would get outputted on register Y, and that goes round back up to register X through the buffer. We're using a pathway based architecture, I think we might have mentioned it before. Um, that means we have an instruction memory up here and a data memory here. So the reason we've gone to a hardware architecture, which is has different because the um, instruction memory here and the main memory for data, which instructions can access and actually change, uh, are separate and are accessed via different buses. Um, so the instruction memory is not actually going to be writable, it's going to be set up beforehand, uh, so that's how your actual program ends up with, and you will cycle through that as the program dictates. And then the actual data you're doing, so storing results or anything like that, or working values would be in the main memory. Uh, the reason we've had to do this is mostly because of um, the limitations of the uh, instruction size. Having settled at an 8-bit ALU, it makes sense to only have an 8-bit address space, which means that uh, there are 256 different instructions, um, which isn't a lot to actually be doing a program with. Although it's, yeah. So this, this um, can be seen in the instruction which is here, so we end up with only two parts, which are the opcode and operand. So there's what the instruction is actually doing and what it's doing it with. Yeah, so we've also, um, to be able to sort of do everything your computer should be able to do, we've also got jump instructions, which are using the carry and zero flags. We support to be able to jump if one of these flags is set and the syntax of the command is jump to line or pointer. Um, the, as most of you will probably know, with any kind of CPU architect, you have a program counter, which we've got here, it kind of represents where you are in the program. If you're jumping somewhere, uh, you will need to update your program counter to say if you would jump, for example, with line numbers, if you were on line 10 and you jump back to 5, you need to update your program counter so the next line you go to is 6, or the next instruction you go to would be instruction 6. Um, that makes the program counter a little bit more difficult as a component because 
you can get sort of you can get the flip flop kind of thing we were using before the uh, 74574, uh, and you could store a value in that, and you could have like a you could use sort of the eight bit adder to increment that as you go through. But then you have to build a separate adder, which, bearing in mind the first one took Andre two weeks, is kind of impractical. Um, the alternative is you can get these incremental counters, which would let you, you every time you clocked it, the value store would be inc incremented by one in output, but then you can't program it, so if you were jumping from 10 to 6, you, it wouldn't let you. So what we've decided to do with the program counter is to work, work on the basis of we've demonstrated that we know how to make an 8-bit adder, well, that Andre knows how to make an 8-bit adder, and we know how to understand it, uh, and we're going to use two 4-bit full adders, uh, and then just an 8-bit flip-flop, sort of SRAM kind of set up for the program counter. And then that would, that would allow us to have a constant 1 on there, and that would allow us to, when clocked, increment the program counter, but also to reset it to a value of our choice when we do a jump instruction. Okay, so while I was right there sending an email to a mailing list, uh, my egocentric teammates basically described the whole diagram, so I'm only left with the decoder. So, as you may have noticed by the fact that, well, the, the quality of the video has suddenly decreased while I, while I stepped in, Sam's camera's battery has died, so I'm now recorded with an awesome iPhone. Okay, so let's talk about the decoder. The decoder does, does nothing more than just decode the opcodes given in the instruction register, and decide which functional units, which functional unit to enable and disable at, in sequentially. So think about it, it's the most important part of the CPU, so it's my honor to, to present it to you. Let's take the example of a simple, uh, a simple load instruction, which can be an 8-bit zero code, for example. Uh, we haven't decided this, if you will probably decide later, but yeah, let's say an 8-bit 8 8 zero. It takes the opcode and decides that the first micro instruction to read is, uh, say, 001, and goes to the second unit, which is the micro instruction decoder, and executes that micro instruction. So it points to the memory, it points to uh, the ALU, and it points to register Y, and it basically routes all the data to register Y. Um, then uh, the, uh, the micro instruction has a corresponding next instruction, which is pointing to the next address in the micro in in, uh, in, in the decoder. Uh, we have a lot lots of issues around memory too. Uh, for example, the instruction memory is, uh, is the instruction the instruction width is 16 bits, while the instruction uh, memory instruction uh, read bus is only 8 bits. So we're probably going to have to do two consecutive, two sequential reads between, uh, in order to get one, uh, one instruction. This could be probably optimized by looking at the opcode and deciding if, if we need an extra operand or not. Other than that, I think this is pretty much it. I'll see you guys next week when uh, we're going to show you what we've done on the hardware side.